I can't honestly say that there was ever a moment where I thought ahead of time that it was going to end up being as catastrophic as it ended up being. When I woke up that morning, my backyard was full of water. It just kept rising to the point that they finally said, you're beyond our models and we don't really know what it's going to do. Next thing I knew, the water was up to the top of my house, right to, right to the pitch of my house. And I, everything, everything was gone. There were some counties like Jones County, parts of Lenore County, that were getting to the close to being 70% inundated. The whole town was underwater for 10 days. It was a time where people were scared, they were shocked, there was a great deal of uncertainty. I don't think you will ever recover if you live 50 years. It's been 10 years since Hurricane Floyd hit North Carolina. Some say it was our state's Katrina. There are some similarities and some differences, but both storms have two important things in common. Both caused unexpected and unprecedented damage and both left an impact on people and places that will last for decades. It's already hot and dry. In the summer of 1999, Eastern North Carolina was suffering from a severe drought. When people here saw Hurricane Dennis in the Atlantic, they actually hoped it would come and bring relief. On September the 5th, it did. It wasn't a particularly powerful storm in terms of wind when it got back to North Carolina, but it sure did produce a lot of rain. Rainfall totals in eastern North Carolina ranged from 6 to 16 inches. Just days later, Hurricane Floyd approached the eastern seaboard as a Category 4 storm. But Floyd weakened as it made a turn towards North Carolina. It was a Category 2 hurricane when it made landfall at Cape Fear September the 16th. What forecasters didn't anticipate was just how much rain would fall ahead of the storm. I think everybody knew that, that somebody was going to get 6 to 12 inches of rain with Floyd itself, but the fact that there was going to be another 6 or 8 on top of that before the storm ever really arrived was the, the really tough thing to call. It is a rain event, and these are not just drenching rain, these are flooding rain. 20 inches of rain fell on ground already saturated by Dennis. We've got the worst flooding we've ever had in a storm. Creeks and streams began to overflow their banks. And it just started to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where eventually you had all a bunch of different creeks and streams that all merged together. The water's supposed to come up another six feet. Rivers rose to record levels. The water began flooding homes. I've been there 30 years and it just breaks my heart. It started covering secondary roads and interstates. Some counties were nearly 70% inundated. The bottom line is, I mean, eastern North Carolina became pretty much a lake. Floyd killed 52 people in North Carolina. Most of them drowned as they tried to flee to higher ground in their cars. More than 87,000 people registered with FEMA as storm victims. The floods destroyed about 8,000 homes and damaged more than 67,000. About 12,000 businesses were damaged. The flooding caused about $6 billion in property damage. It halted agricultural production in eastern North Carolina, causing more than a billion dollars in farm losses. The floods killed nearly 3 million chickens and turkeys and more than 30,000 hogs. There were people that lost their whole herds. There were environmental losses too. Floodwaters were contaminated with human waste, hog and poultry waste, and fertilizers. There was so much material washed into the Noose and the Pamlico Sound estuaries that it created a condition called hypoxia, where all the oxygen was used up. Of course, that kills all the fish that are 
trapped in the area and anything that's attached to the bottom. Scientists are still unsure about the long-term impact of residue from gasoline, oil, and chemicals that may still be on the bottom of Pamlico Sound. The weather may have only lasted a couple of days, but boy, the impacts just went on for a long time. Next, the long-term impacts on communities across eastern North Carolina. It's probably a thing you may never totally recover from. Floyd left a mark on many communities you can still see today. In some towns, there are vacant lots and empty buildings where once there were homes and businesses. But in many communities, there's been rebuilding of structures and spirit. We could actually reach up and touch the bottom of the stoplight there from the boat. Chuck Barwick is back in his hometown of Seven Springs. It's on the Noose River between Goldsboro and Kenston. Ten years ago, he was coming down the street in a boat when WRL News reporter Amanda Lamb caught up with him. EMT Chuck Barwick helped rescue residents when the water started to rise. The people were my family and were my friends. And uh, knowing that they were getting ready to lose something that they had spent the majority of their life trying to get, it really does something to you. That was probably the worst feeling during the whole thing is to watch my family and friends go through that loss. Barwick does have one positive memory of the flood. The community pulling together to help others. But some people left the community after that. You know, to drive down a street 10 years later and see where, you know, somebody used to live that was put out of place because of a flood of a natural disaster, then, you know, yeah, it's, I don't think the town will ever fully recover from that. Homes are missing just downriver in Kenston, too. You can see the driveway after driveway. There were people's homes and communities that just aren't there anymore. So that's something we're still, I think, adjusting to and working through. Floyd's floodwaters covered Highway 70, inundated dozens of businesses and 700 homes. I look back today and say, I just can't believe that these areas in Kenston went underwater. It's just hard to imagine it. Floodwaters also covered Kenston's Peachtree Wastewater Treatment Plant shutting it down and washing raw sewage into the water. But a decade after the city's darkest hour, there's a brighter day. The impact on our community, I think, really is long-lasting, and in the end, most of it is for the better. FEMA funds helped pay for an expansion of the city's north side wastewater treatment plant. That allowed it to close the troubled peach tree plant, which had been plagued by water quality violations for years. The benefit to the community of getting that facility out of harm's way um, really is a positive occurrence from or result from Hurricane Floyd. So were state funds that allowed the city to move junkyards away from the river that had been flooded by Floyd. You had vehicles with gas and other oils in them and you could see the plume going downstream. The city has restricted new commercial and residential development in the floodplain and most of the city's flooded out residents took advantage of a FEMA buyout program and state funds to relocate to higher ground. Most of them are in homes that are as good or better as what they lived in before. Recreational areas are being developed where the homes once stood. We still have some things to work through for the next big flood, but it'll be a lot less impact on the community. Let's go right here. Harvey Suggs Hog Farm is on the Noose River just outside of Kenston. Hurricane Floyd spared his farm but not the floodwaters that started rushing in the next day. The water continued to come up and we were running out of room in our houses and we knew it wasn't going to get any better for several days. Suggs rounded up 30 people in two boats. They loaded the hogs onto the boats and took them to higher ground. It was an all day deal. I mean, everybody worked to save the hogs. Suggs lost only 70 of his 2,800 hogs. In a couple of days, we would have lost them all. Suggs Waste Lagoon never flooded. Actually, the lagoon itself saved some of our pigs because that was the only thing in this entire area that was above water was the lagoon dock. Suggs was back in business in about five weeks. I feel confident in saying if we see another storm coming like that, we're going to be moving hogs before it hits. Up in Tarboro, jeweler Rex Browning was back at work the day after Floyd hit. He says the Tar River was high but the town was dry. Sometime early the next morning, came down here and water was almost knee deep. And uh, then 
it just kept, kept right on coming up. WRL News reporter Todd Hauer caught up with Browning after the floodwaters receded. The water seeped into every crack and crevice. This water rust in gold. Family treasures ruined and a business Rex Browning has treasured for 42 years all but gone. Starting all over again? Yeah. No. I was hoping not. But Browning did start over. It wasn't easy. Everything I'd ever made, I put in here. So what I had, a lot of it was gone. Since Browning's store wasn't in the floodplain, he had no flood insurance. Still, he managed to renovate his store and reopen two and a half months later. Ten years later, it's still not the same. Every day I reach over to get a tool that I used to have that isn't there anymore. So uh, you, you do it little by little, day by day. Still moving forward, but still unable to shake one vivid memory. Seeing, <clears throat> seeing what you worked for for all these years and seeing it on the street is trash. It's important to remember these disasters. That Upriver in Rocky Mount, the National Weather Service erected a sign last May showing where the Tar River's floodwaters crested on September the 17th, 1999, at nearly 33 feet. That is nearly 18 feet above flood stage. It was an absolute shock. Former Mayor Fred Turnage says nearly 25% of the city was underwater. We had hundreds, maybe thousands of people who needed help. And they were frankly scared, very terrified by what had happened. Turnage says the city's emergency response teams were overwhelmed. We were not tremendously prepared by any means. We had never experienced anything of this magnitude. Uh, our response was amazingly good considering how unprepared we might have been. I think I might lose the second floor too. The floodwaters destroyed or damaged about 3,000 homes. Dozens of businesses were flooded too. Among them, the businesses inside Terrytown Mall, a Rocky Mount landmark that was the second oldest mall in North Carolina. The city lost all of its cultural arts centers, its community center, its largest park, several ball fields, and its two pools. There was a lot of confusion, a lot of fright, and it took a while to, to kind of reassure people, look, we can beat this thing. Come in and help them out and get a smile on their face. Turnage says people gained confidence when a flood of help arrived. It's like having angels. Federal and state agencies, as well as hundreds of volunteers, descended on Rocky Mount. People helped each other, too. What was our worst moment? maybe in our history, turned out to be maybe one of our best moments in terms of, of a community coming together, caring about one another. FEMA bought out more than 400 homes, moving their residents out of the floodplain. Parks and greenways have replaced many of them. The old Terrytown Mall site was elevated, and a new Sam's Club is there today. And the city has restored or replaced all of the cultural and recreational facilities it lost in the flood. Turnage says thanks to Floyd, they're better than they were before, and so is Rocky Mount. I think in a sense we have a, a better feeling of community because of what we went through. Next, after Floyd, a town fights for its identity. FEMA wanted to come in and just bow the area and just move everybody out. The Edgecombe County town of Princeville was nearly wiped off the map by Hurricane Floyd, but the flood brought Princeville a lot of attention in part because of the town's historical significance. In some ways, all of that attention actually helped to put Princeville on the map. Eddie Hinton has run his body shop behind his house in Princeville for nearly 30 years. Getting stretches out. When the floodwaters came, he scrambled to the roof of his house, carrying some of his clothes with him. And by that time, a helicopter would come around, and they saw me on top of the house, and, and they sit over the house, told me I had to go. I said, no, I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> so I said, I ride on the boat. He said, well, some boats are on the way down here. I said, I get on the boat, but I said, I'm not getting on the helicopter. The truck site was almost covered with water. We had truckers that had parked their truck site there, and those trucks were completely covered with water, you know? So that, that was a lot of water. Princeville was underwater for more than a week. In some places it was 24 feet. 
Nearly 700 homes were destroyed or damaged. A WRL News crew caught up with Eddie Hinton in the FEMA trailer he lived in for more than two months. I lost a lot. Well, I have lost my faith in God. I have, I have lost my faith. I believe from here on we can, we can step by step, we'll, we'll make it. FEMA offered to buy out residents and move the town to higher ground. At the time, Claude Johnson was for the buyout. It got to be my choice to do what I want to do over here. I can't decide what next door is going to do. Princeville resident Bertha Barlow wanted to stay put. And if we can move back and rebuild and God bless us to rebuild, we're going to do it. I don't know who wants to sell out, but I don't. Town council was split over the buyout. Mayor Delia Perkins cast the deciding vote to reject it and rebuild Princeville. I think the main fact was that uh, this was a place of heritage and that uh, the majority of people wanted to stay. Freed slaves founded Princeville. It was the first town chartered by blacks in the nation. That got national attention because Floyd got national media coverage. It instilled a new sense of pride among many Princeville residents. This is our home. That's where we've been all our life, is here in Princeville. And, and, and uh, it, it just, it's just our home. Bertha Barlow has a new home in her old town. She says if it were anywhere else, it wouldn't be Princeville. I'm glad they made the right decision. FEMA gave Princeville residents $26 million to help rebuild, an average of about 13,000 per person. The town got one and a half million dollars. It built a new town hall and is shoring up its dike. New housing standards are also in place and home values have increased. Through it all, I think the town of Princeville has, um, is much better than it was. But there are still abandoned buildings in town and not everyone is better off. Claude Johnson says he couldn't afford to rebuild his house in Princeville. The money that FEMA gave me and my wife, it wasn't well, enough to even get the house to even start. Now, the Johnsons are struggling to make payments on a new house in Tarboro. I don't believe in giving up. I don't. Eddie Hinton is in the same boat. The house Floyd destroyed was paid for, and he was debt free. Now, he's got a mortgage on a new home. More debt than I ever been in my life. I'll never pay for that house. I won't ever be able to enjoy it. It's a free house, because it won't be free. And neither is he. He was about to retire when Floyd hit. Now, at 72, he has to keep working to make his house payments. It's not easy, not easy. Well, I got to hang in here. <laughs> next, how better prepared are we for the next Floyd? I believe North Carolina is the leader in the nation of depicting where risk really is for flooding. To learn more about Hurricane Floyd, visit WREL.com. Click on news, then documentaries. The magnitude of Floyd's floodwaters surprised some forecasters and overwhelmed many emergency responders. So, a decade later, are we better prepared for the next big flood? This map depicts all of the 100 and 500 year special flood hazard areas. That Floyd revealed a big weakness in North Carolina's flood planning. We determined that about 80% of the homes damaged or destroyed at the time were not accurately depicted in the flood zone. That's because in 1999, flood maps were 10 to 15 years old and woefully out of date. That paved the way for development in the floodplain and dire consequences later. Well, many people were building homes in flooded areas without understanding the risk. Floyd destroyed many of those homes. Many homeowners didn't have flood insurance since the old maps didn't show them in the floodplain. Since Floyd, North Carolina has used new technology to create new flood maps. It's collected elevation data, studied 28,000 miles of streams, and installed new stream gauges. What we're doing through the floodplain mapping program is leveraging that data to accurately show where the water is real time uh, during an event. Norman says that will save lives and by helping to steer development clear of flood prone areas the maps will save property too. The mapping cost 120 million dollars but Norman says if these maps had been in place before 1999 
nearly half a billion dollars in property damage could have been avoided. Right in here is where Tarboro Principal is located. The new flood maps are also accessible to anyone online, instead of being filed away in a government building as they were a decade ago. <laughs> the state is also using the new maps to identify hog farms in the floodplain. So far, it's spent nearly $19 million to move 39 farms and 91 waste lagoons out of flood-prone areas and has prohibited new lagoon construction there. A lot of those farms that are in the floodplain have now been mitigated, which means they no longer exist so that they wouldn't flood again. But there are still 92 hog farms in the floodplain, as well as hundreds of homes and businesses. Having all those materials in the floodplain of these rivers just doesn't really make sense. The State Division of Emergency Management has used Homeland Security and other federal funds to beef up its response capability. There's a new statewide radio communication network that allows local, state, and federal response agencies to all communicate with each other. And 10 years ago, we could not do that. There's a new evacuation plan with more shelters. The state has nine new mobile medical units tied to local hospitals. There are now state and local animal response teams and 24 new companion animal mobile equipment trailers to feed and shelter people's pets. Pets are important because people will not evacuate if they don't have a place to take their pet. There are more swift water rescue teams and Hilo aquatic rescue teams using National Guard helicopters. With all of the improvements, the state hopes to better protect lives and property from the next catastrophic flood, even a 500 year flood like Floyd. Calling it a 500 year flood doesn't mean it's going to necessarily be another 500 years before it, it happens.